So our next speaker today is Al Luna, who I have known for a number of years now. She spent the first part of her career designing and building mobile apps and product experiences, like many of us here. Uh, her career was progressing like she thought it was supposed to. Uh, that is until she started having a recurring dream about a white room. Well, we all dream, but Elle's dream changed her life and her career path forever. She started exploring what she calls the crossroads of should and must. She says that should is how others want us to show up in the world, while must is when there aren't options and we don't have a choice. We are what we believe. Those dreams about a white room drove Elle to quit her job and make art full-time. And what she realized is that Essentially, our lives can be, made, can be one and the same with our work, truly intermingled. It's made a huge impact on her creative process, so I'm honored to invite Elle to share uh, on the stage how the power of dreams can manifest themselves in real life. So, Elle. It all started with a dream, a white room with tall white walls, warehouse windows, and a concrete floor. And in this dream, I would walk into this space and I would sit down on the floor and I would be filled with the most unbelievable sense of peace and calm. That was it. That was my dream. Simple enough, easily forgotten the next day, except I had it again and again. Where do our dreams come from? How do you have the dreams that you do? I was telling a friend about this space, and she asked the question that turned my life inside out. She said, have you ever thought about looking for your dream in real life? Well, no, I hadn't. That sounded ridiculous. Except I eventually began to wonder, what if it wasn't? What if it wasn't so silly? What if there was greater intelligence behind our dreams? And so I asked the question that you ask when you get caught by such a question, which is, when you decide to look for your dreams in real life, where do you even begin? Craigslist. I had no idea what I was looking for or really what I was going to find, but wow, I had this feeling, I had this deep intuitive sense that whatever I was looking for was in some way looking for me too. Have you ever felt like this about something in your life? felt that it was inevitable, that it just had to happen. Weeks went by, I continued my search, and one day I saw it right there on the screen, this room that I had been dreaming about. And you're going to love this, there was an open house the very next day. I went to the open house, I got the apartment, and I moved in two weeks later. On my first day in the space, I walked in and I knowingly took my place on the concrete floor and I awaited for the peace to arrive. <laughs> Unexpectedly, I began to panic. What was this all about? What was really going on? As though suddenly awakening from my dream, I asked the room out loud, this room that had called me to it, why am I here? as clear as day, as clear as anything that I know to be true. The room replied, it's time to paint. I had made art all the time as a kid, through high school, through college, but somewhere along the way I just got busy and I just sort of forgot about it. The next morning I woke up, I went to the art supply store and I got the band back together again. And I came back and I began working in this white room from my dreams. I began a most wild and wondrous journey 
of creating my dream in real life. This is my studio. This is a space that I had been craving and longing for without really even knowing it. In fact, I actually just really needed this space in my life, a blank space, a tabula rasa, as Aristotle called it. I needed this inner place of pathlessness, of nothingness, of emptiness, a place where there were no roadmaps, no case studies, no right answers. This is how my journey began. The only catch is that I had a full-time job. <laughs> I was working well over 40 hours a week at a startup in San Francisco. I was the design lead at Mailbox, and we wanted to revolutionize email for the mobile phone. Around this time, I came across a biography by Ariana Huffington about Picasso and how he chose to balance his work and his life. And there's this one insight that she makes that is so phenomenal, and I want to share it with you today. She says, the more I discovered about Picasso's life and the more I delved into his work, the more the two converged. It's not what an artist does that counts, but what he is, Picasso said. But Picasso's work was so thoroughly autobiographical that what he did was what he was. I read those sentences over and over again, and they led me to a question. What if who we are and what we do are one and the same? What if we no longer go to work or create the work, but instead become the work? Back at the startup, it was early on a Tuesday when we shared our app with the world, and our launch was an unmitigated success. I remember looking around that room thinking, wow, this is one of the highlights of my life. But in the back of my mind, the questions lingered. I needed this tabula rasa undeniably, inexplicably. I needed this space, this retreat at this point in my life where I could hear myself think, where I could step away from all of the voices of other people telling me how I should live my life. And this is when the crossroads between should and must appeared very clearly. Two paths, both equally appealing, but they were different and I had to choose. Should is how other people want us to show up in the world. It's all of the expectations and others, and expectations and obligations that others layer upon us. When we choose should, we can feel it in our bodies. Our muscles begin to contract, our bodies begin to constrict. And the part that's really hard is when Culture says that we should do something, but we know it's really wrong for us. When we choose should, we are choosing to live our life for someone or something other than ourselves. Must is different. Must is who you are, what you believe, what you know to be true when you are alone with your truest, most authentic self. It's your passions, your urges, your deepest held longings it's that which for you is undeniable, inexplicable. And choosing must is the greatest thing we can do with our lives. What I knew I needed in my life was not only a literal rest, because I was exhausted, but I also wanted a restful mind, free from all of this business of life free from all of the hecticness and the goal-orientedness that comes along with meetings, 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 and all of the trappings of the corporate world, which I adored, but I realized was causing a lot of trappings for me in my life. I took a look at my finances, and I saw that I could buy myself a little bit of time, and I decided to give it a go. I put in my two weeks' notice, and I quit. 
What I have learned since that day is that we all arrive at this crossroads over and over again throughout our lives. And every day, every time we make a decision, we get to choose should or must. Must sounds great, but if it's so great, why don't we choose it all the time, right? Well, I was thinking about this question and a whole host of others. As I was working for some time in the white room for my dreams, and I eventually decided to collect all of these questions together into an essay. Now, probably like so many of you, I share things online every day, all of the time. And the spirit of this was the same, except something about this post was very different. Within two weeks, it was tweeted to over five million people and read by over a quarter of a million readers. Curious, I began talking to people about their shoulds and their musts, and it turned out there was something here. There was a deep need for people to understand this crossroads in their lives. So I decided to extend the essay into a book, and it came out this spring. As a part of launching the book, I got to travel around. I had the opportunity to meet with people and to hear their stories in all corners of the United States, people of all ages. And what I found were recurring patterns. It was incredible to hear some of the same themes come up again and again, and today I want to share four of them with you. Maybe some of these questions you yourself are asking right now. First, it turns out that having a must, that feeling that you must have a must, can be overwhelming. It can feel daunting. And many people just don't know where to begin. Is this you? Is this resonating? If so, you're not alone. And I have an idea for you. Call your mom. <laughs> Call her or somebody who knew you when you were little and ask them to tell you stories about what you were like. Because nowhere is the essence of must more purely exhibited than when we're kids. Who were you as a child? What did you love to do? Where were you when you last really, really felt like you? Next, let's get practical. It turns out that choosing must raises a lot of very real and very scary questions. The most common one that I hear over and over again is this one. But what if doing what I love doesn't pay? Well, in a TED Talk, artist and designer Stefan Sagmeister talks about three different modes of work. A job, he says, is something typically done from nine to five, something typically done for pay. A career is a system of advancements over time, and a calling is something that we do for intrinsic motivation, something done regardless of pay. And as I thought about these three different modes of work, I began to ask a question, and I share this question with you all. Which of these do you have with your work, with your projects, both paid and unpaid? I started looking at other creatives throughout time. How did they figure this out? And it turns out that by having an awareness of these different modes of work, they were able to combine them in really cool ways. For example, the author T.S. Eliot, we all know him because he was an incredible writer. Did you know that T.S. Eliot was also a banker? He was an incredible financial mind in London, and I bet that having a career in finance actually created the space in his life for him to write. Keith Haring, the artist Keith Haring, whose works are incredible, he kept his finances very far away from his calling. He took on all sorts of odd jobs early on in his career, and he was a busboy at one point. Maybe you have a job from nine to five while you pursue your calling on nights and weekends. Or maybe you have a calling that you work on 24-7 and you make a living from it. There is dignity in all work. And just because you do something for pay doesn't make that work dirty. And also, if you want to find your calling, it doesn't mean that you need to quit your job. You get to decide what's right for you, what's right for your life. 
One of the greatest composers of our time, Philip Glass, said once in an interview, while working, I suddenly heard a noise and looked up to find Robert Hughes, the art critic of Time magazine, staring at me in disbelief. But you're Philip Glass. What are you doing here? I said, it was obvious that I was installing his dishwasher. And I told him that I would soon be finished. But you're an artist, he protested. I explained that I was an artist, but that I was also sometimes a plumber as well. And he should go away and let me finish. <laughs> Amen. So this next one, it's really, really important, particularly for the time in which we live. Space. Must needs some space. Must needs some solitude. And must needs you. For me, my space is my white room. It's where I go to quiet the voices and to descend into my work. Where is your space for must in your everyday life? Is it a park bench? Is it a spot at the public library? Is it a block of time on your calendar that's just for you? Part of the problem that we have around choosing must in our everyday lives is that we're just so busy and we are addicted to being busy. If you want to find must, find 10 minutes. Where is your space? Now, we talk a lot about time, money, we talk about space as reasons for not choosing must in our life. But I actually think the real reason that we don't choose must is far scarier, and it's spoken about much less. Should. Shoulds are put on us from the moment that we are born. This is a normal process because we are essentially born as wild creatures, and we need to learn how to survive in the world. And should teaches us that. It teaches us how to survive. But as we grow up, it's an evolutionary process for us to wake up to the shoulds that we've inherited from our families, our communities, our culture, and for us to should, us to shed and let go of the shoulds that no longer serve our evolving truth for who we are. But sometimes we linger in should a little longer than expected. Sometimes a lot longer. And we might find ourselves as adults still living in a world of shoulds from childhood that we have not yet consciously examined. I was talking about this with a friend one day and he said, are you familiar with a man named Gurdjieff? He was a spiritual teacher around the turn of the century. And one day he posed a question to his students. He said, if you want to be free from prison, if you want to escape, what is the first thing that you need to know? You need to get to know the guard, one student said. You need to find the key, said another. No, Gurdjieff said. If you want to escape from prison, the first thing that you need to know is that you are in prison. Until you know that, no escape is possible. If we want to be free, really, truly free, we first have to understand why are we not free? What keeps us from being free? What shoulds do you carry around with you day in and day out? Where my work is headed now is looking at what shoulds do I, as a woman, carry around with me? Now, whether you're a woman, a man, African-American, Latino, are there certain shoulds that keep you categorized as that? Are there certain shoulds that keep you imprisoned? I've begun wondering, what shoulds do I feel that society holds me accountable for? What are women obligated to do? You should never age. Advertising tells me this. Advertising tells me that I should be slim and beautiful and youthful forever. 
wow, I can feel this in my body right now as I'm talking about it. Incredible pressure. And yet, I also have to acknowledge that as a woman in my youth, I'm benefiting from this power tremendously right now. You should always obey. Unfortunately, we made some decisions a long time ago about women's roles and men's roles that while time has played out and the landscape has changed, these belief systems are still in us. They are still in our collective unconscious. You should know better than to be outspoken. You should know better than to cross the line. Now, I don't know if any other women experience this, but throughout my life, I've often felt encouraged, deeply encouraged, and championed to be brilliant, to be smart, to be amazing, to be an individual, a maverick, to push the status quo, but only so far, to not rock the boat. This is a prison, and each of these belief systems keep me alienated from my truest, most authentic self. Even as I read these out loud, I can, I can feel my muscles contracting. I can feel my whole body shrinking. But if we want to get to know must, we have to bring awareness to these shoulds. And as you think about your shoulds in your life, you can begin to ask them a couple simple questions. Like, where did you come from? When did I first pick you up? Are you really true for me, for my life, for who I've become? And most importantly, do I really want to keep holding on to you? Because you're heavy, and I have to carry you around with me day in and day out into every meeting, every friendship, every relationship. And maybe I decide to kindly set you down now. Maybe it is long past its due, and this is an incredibly empowering moment because should is the prison guard to must. And just as we get to know our prison, each one of us, we have the opportunity in our lifetime to set ourselves free. Free. Really, truly, deeply free. I think this is what Janis Joplin meant when she sang, freedom is just another word for nothing left to lose. Anybody can do this. I can, you can. The person to your left, the person to your right. But we need your uniqueness. We need you to show up uniquely. We need you now, perhaps, more than ever, to step into the fullness of your gifts, to step into the fullness of your must and what you have to offer in this lifetime. There is no such thing as competition. Everybody gets to come. And there are some moments when I imagine everybody manifesting the fullness of their gifts. It just brings me to my knees. Imagine that world and we can create it. Why not create it today? Why not create it now? If you want to choose must, you can, and you can do it today. And here's how. Just do one thing. Just take one step towards that which you must do. In that spirit, I'd love to invite you to open up the envelopes that you received in your welcome bag, if you have them. And inside, you will find a series of cards with prompts on them. If you don't have the envelope, look at a neighbor. Maybe they have one and they can share. Now on these cards, there are a bunch of different prompts and they're spread all throughout this enormous room as the lights come up. Wow, so cool. 
And what I invite you to do, using any tool you like with words or images, is for a moment to respond to this prompt very quickly. What do you feel called to capture on this card? I'd like for you to take maybe 60 seconds, and if you don't have your card, that's okay, because what we're going to do is after we end this session, please pass your, your cards to the aisle, and the ushers will grab them and take them outside, and then we're going to hang all of them up on a wall right before you go in to lunch. So please take 60 seconds before I conclude and capture your thoughts on the card. How was that? Easy? Difficult? I can't wait to see what you all have created. I'd like to conclude with a story about a piano. One day in San Francisco, I decided to take my inner artist on a date, and I took myself to the San Francisco Symphony to hear Andreas Schiff play Bach's French Suites. I got all dressed up, I got on my bike, I biked across the city, the sun was going down, it was beautiful. I parked right out front. I went inside and I got a seat right up close to the front of the stage and all there was was this beautiful black baby grand piano. The performer came out and he played and I noticed that the man next to me had also come alone. And throughout the performance, he seemed to be enjoying the performance on another level entirely. I could almost feel him energetically experiencing the work at an entirely different level. At the end, during the standing ovation, I leaned over to my friend and I said, so, what did you think? Wow, he said, I have downloaded his performances for years and I have watched so many of his performances and listened to his music. But this, this, to be right here, to be so close to the stage that I can feel the strings of the piano vibrating inside of my body, to be so close that I can watch him play for three straight hours with his eyes closed, without stopping, entirely from memory. This is to experience something with soul in it. Wow, I said, you must be a pianist. Who, me? He said, no, I can't play a tune. But you know, I often have a dream where I can. Thank you.